and I will just stop. I will just start to share my screen with you guys. And just a quick reminder, make sure you keep your sound turned off because it can get a bit distracting if we've got background noise. Remember any questions you can share in the chat. We'll try and answer those as and when they come through. And um, please pop answers to any questions that I'm asking in the chat as well. Feel free to be um, uh, answering anything that we're coming up with today. So what we'll look at today is why we use soap. And this is quite topical as recently we have been told to wash our hands more often. So what's the environmental impact of the things that we use to wash and clean? And we'll be thinking about what impact these ingredients in our soaps might have. We'll be exploring how we can in, uh, reduce the impact of single use plastic bottles that we use for soap, so like shampoo bottles. And we're going to also look at what alternatives that we could potentially make ourselves. So quick reminders to everyone, because I see that a couple of people have just come in. Microphones off for any answers or any questions, pop them in the chat because we will be monitoring that throughout the session. So to start off, I want everybody to have a think about why we wash our hands. And why have we been told to wash our hands more during the pandemic? So reminder, we need to have microphones off just so that there's not background noise that could distract people. And answers to questions can be popped in the chat. So why do we wash our hands? And why have we been told to wash our hands more during the pandemic? Feel free to pop answers in the chat. And I'll leave you with a little bit longer to think about that. Let's see if we get any answers through. Brilliant. Yep, so we've got to get germs off and someone else has said to keep them clean. But why have we been told to wash our hands more during the pandemic? And you might recognize this picture. So this is a picture of a COVID-19 virus particle. So people have said that we wash our hands to keep them clean. But what we're going to look at is the science behind how that works. So why do we wash our hands? If I was gardening, I might have some dirt on my hands. And when I came inside and I wanted to come in and have my lunch, I would want to wash my hands. So I'd want to wash this dirt away. So I would use soap, which is made of very small molecules. These small molecules, are known as surfactants, and we'll come back to this term a bit later. What this means is that it lowers the surface tension of the water. But these special soap molecules also do something quite clever. What they have is they have a head that is hydrophilic, and what that means is the head of this molecule is attracted to water. And the bottom, the tail of this molecule, the hydrophobic tail, repels water. So good point, someone said you can't always see the dirt on your hands. And we'll come to that in a moment. So you know, the COVID particle that we looked at, you would not be able to see if that was on your hands. So here we have a lot of these soap molecules. And what they do is the hydrophobic tail, so the bit that doesn't like the water, will trap the dirt. And what do we use when we wash our hands? We use water from the tap. And remember, this end of the molecule, the hydrophilic head, that means that it likes the water, will mean that when we wash our hands with the water, 
we will wash that away. So the water will wash away this dirt easily after the soap has trapped it. But what will happen to a virus? So does anyone have any ideas what might happen when we wash our hands when our hands have a virus on? So this is a picture of a virus. Here we've got inside the virus, all the genetic information. So that codes for all of the things this virus does. On the outside of this virus, we have a membrane. So that is the outside of the virus that holds all the inside bits in there. This is made up of fats. And on the very outside, we have these spike proteins. So if you remember the picture we looked at at the start, this looks kind of similar to that picture. What do you guys think will happen to a virus when we wash our hands with soap? Any ideas in the chat? What just happened to our dirt particles? Oh, yeah, we've had a great answer. So it dies and it is washed off. Correct, yeah. So what we're going to look at now is we're going to see how that works. So we have our soap molecules. So I'm about to wash that my hands with this soap. And these soap molecules, they break the membrane. So they break down the fatty outside of this virus. What that means is this genetic information can no longer be contained inside. So all of this information inside this virus can't stay in there anymore because we've broken the wall on the outside of the virus with these soap particles. The, the rest of this virus will also be trapped by the soap and broken down. And again, when we rinse our hands off with the water, this will also all be washed away. So it's really important to wash our hands with soap. But how can we make these soap molecules? How are they made? And that is by a reaction called saponification. So when we make soap, there's two things that we use, lye and oils. Don't worry if you don't know what lye is, we'll get into that a bit more in detail in a bit. So what we use is we use things like vegetable oils and they provide these fats called triglycerides. And we can see at the bottom here, our triglycerides have three uh, parts that can react here, three parts sticking out of our molecule. So there's three bits here. So what we do is we react this with lime, which is usually sodium hydroxide, but sometimes potassium hydroxide. Again, don't worry too much about what these things are. When we have a look at how this is made, we add the triglyceride and the sodium hydroxide together. And you notice at the end of this reaction on the right hand side of the arrow, we still have our backbone from the triglyceride, but we've swapped some of the parts of the sodium hydroxide here, and we have ended up with glycerin and our soap molecules. And here you can see that our soap molecules on the very right hand side look similar with the head and the tail. Don't worry too much about this complicated picture because we're now going to watch a video that explains that in a bit more detail. In this video, we are going to learn about how soap is made by a process called hydrolysis and how we can control whether the soap produced is hard or soft. Soap is a detergent and has been around for thousands of years. 
Traditionally, ash from wood fires acted on animal fat in the first soap making processes. When animals were baked on a spit over a wood fire, the fat would drop onto the ashes. The ash contained potassium carbonate, which broke apart the fats, and so the ashes, when wetted, were excellent as a cleaning agent for the pots and pans. Soap is a substance that, when used with water, removes dirt and oil away from the skin or other materials such as clothing. So key point there, it needs to be used with water. Soaps have always been made in a similar way, using hydrolysis. The fancy word for this process is saponification. Chemically, fatty acids or oils combine with a base, typically sodium hydroxide and water. The result of this process is soap and a chemical called glycerine. This is seen in the chemical reaction where the fatty ester highlighted is broken down to form a carboxylate salt and glycerin. So this is the reaction we just looked at, but just a little bit more complicated looking. So again, don't worry too much about that. This is just showing us what reacts with what to make this reaction work and to make the soap molecules. Glycerin is found in luxury soaps because of its ability to make soaps appear translucent. There are two kinds of soap hard soap and soft soap. What do you think this means? Pause the video and continue when ready. So you guys might know the difference between this. If you use soap at home, I know when I was growing up in different bathrooms, we had different soaps. So in my bathroom at home, I use hard soap. And when I'm out and about, in the soap dispensers in public toilets, we find a lot of soft soap. Soaps can be hard, meaning they can be moulded into shapes, typically a bar, or they can be soft, like those found in hand washers, which are liquefied and kept in bottles. In addition, hard soaps dissolve more slowly, whereas soft soaps dissolve more quickly. Hard soaps are made by using certain fats like coconut oils, lard or cocoa butter. Look at the equation shown now. The R group represents the sign. So we're going to move on from this video because that's just going through the equations that we looked at again. So we saw there the equation that we looked at before that we create these surfactant molecules that wash away the dirt. But we know we need to wash our hands. But what is in the soap, the shampoo and shower gels that we use regularly? Are the ingredients things that we know? So you have an option now if you are somewhere that you can have access to a bottle of soap or shower gel, you can go grab one. But if you can't find any, don't worry, we have pictures in the slides. So I'll give people a few more seconds just in case they want to go grab a bottle of soap or shower gel and have a look at the ingredients alongside what we're looking at. But we'll carry on looking with the pictures that I've got on the slides. So first of all, we'll use shampoo. Who's seen this shampoo before? Does anybody use this one? quite a well-known brand. Yep, so someone said that their mum used this. Someone else says that I, they used to use this brand. So what I've done is I've taken a picture. You might not be able to read this very easily, but don't worry, we don't need to read the whole ingredients list. So this is showing us what's in this shampoo but there's a lot of complicated words there. So we're going to have a look at a couple of these ingredients. First of all, we're going to look at sodium lauryl sulfate. What this does is it makes the soap foam up. So you know when you put shampoo on your hair and you rub it in and it goes into a big thick lather and goes all bubbly? That's what this does. It make, helps make the bubbles. So this is made from palm oil, 
coconut oil or petrochemicals. Can anybody tell me what petrochemicals might mean? Where might petrochemicals come from? So any ideas in the chat? We're getting a couple of answers through. Just see if anyone else has got any options, any ideas before I carry on. So fantastic, we've had a good couple of answers there. So petrochemicals come from oil. <coughs> so this can be made from palm oil, coconut oil, or from our oil that we get our things like petroleum, petrol from. This molecule, sodium lauryl sulfate, this substance does break down when you use it into safe substances. But if it's used things that come from oil or palm oil, both of those things aren't particularly sustainable. And we have a very similar thing here sodium lauryl sulfate and you notice the words are very similar and the and this is very similar to sodium lauryl sulfate these two things are very similar but the one in red sodium lauryl sulfate has an extra step with petrochemicals so it does the same thing helps create the bubbles but more of this molecule comes from petrochemicals. So this means it's probably not very sustainable. What I want you guys to do is have a look out for these on the next slides. So what can we do? What can we do with these? So we can avoid products with SLES, which is sodium lauryl sulfate. We can find companies that use different surfactants. So these are surfactants again. And we can try and find things that don't use palm oil. So try and have a look out for these on the next few slides. This will be something everyone will have used a lot of recently. Hand soap. So I imagine everybody's seen this before, this brand. A lot of people will have seen lots of different hand soaps recently because we've had to wash our hands a lot more during the pandemic to make sure that we're slowing the spread of viruses. So here we have our ingredients. Is there anything anyone recognizes in this ingredients list? See if anyone can notice anything here that we've already looked at or anything else you might recognize that we haven't looked at. Feel free to answer in the chat. So we've got one thing that we've already looked at here, but there's a couple more in there. So what we're going to look at here is this long looking name. So that might be quite hard for you guys to say if you don't know how to say it. What have we got in the chat? Oh, fantastic. So someone has said water is actually the main ingredient. So that's a really important thing to notice. We said when we use soap, we need to use water. So if you were using bar soap, if you had dry hands and you picked it up and tried to rub it in your hands, you would not be able to. Now, liquid hand soap, the main ingredient is actually aqua, which is water. So sometimes you can rub that on your hands before letting them, but you will still need water to wash your hands. You cannot wash your hands without water because you will need to wash the soap away. So here we're looking at another surfactant. So again, this helps make the bubbles. So this one is called cocomidopropyl betaine. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but don't worry, nobody needs to know how to say that. This surfactant is not made from palm oil or petrochemicals. This one is actually made from coconut oil. But when we wash this one down the sink, it is has a potential to build up and become harmful to aquatic life. What, what do I mean by aquatic life? Who can tell me what I mean there? 
So in large quantities, what could this be harmful to? What do, what do I mean by aquatic life? Yep, I've had one answer in the chat, but not just that. Somebody has said fish. Perfect. So that's anything that lives in water. So if you've got your fish, um, potential insects, any mammals that might live in that water, it could have harmful effects on those. So what can we do? We can avoid the products that have this in, and we can find soaps that use more eco plant-based surfactants. Here we have some bar soap. And we've got our ingredients again. Can anybody notice anything here that we've mentioned before? There's a few things. Don't worry if I'm talking when you find that. Feel free to pop in the chat if you recognize anything in here. What we'll look at first in this bar soap is the main ingredient, sodium taloate. So what is this? This is a soap. So this is like the surfactants we were looking at at the very beginning with our saponification reaction. But this is soap made from tallow, and tallow is animal fat, which usually comes from sheep or cows. Perfect. So someone said that in here we've got water. So that's our aqua is water. And then they've also said an ingredient with palm. So we're going to move on to that one in a moment. Well done. And I'll go move on to that when we get to that. So we're still looking at sodium taloate. So what, what does this do? We looked at what soap molecules did earlier. They clean by trapping the dirt. But what is bad about this? So as we said, this is made from animal fat and animal farming has a high impact. And then here we are, sodium palm kernelate. So somebody mentioned so this is made from palm oil and sodium palm kernelate is also a soap molecule. So again, it traps the dirt. You might also find sodium palmate on the ingredients. It's a similar thing, still made from palm oil. So palm and palm oil is not produced sustainably. And there are a lot of ecosystems that are suffering because of palm oil plantations. Some people might remember the, I think it was an Iceland um, advert that had the orangutan in, and that was raising awareness about palm oil. So what can we do? We can avoid products with either of these in soap. So remember that tallowate, sodium tallowate is from animal fat, so it's not particularly sustainable and sodium palm kernelate is from palm oil, and palm oil is also not sustainable. So we've got some options here. You can get sodium olivate from olive oil, sodium cocoa is from coconut oil, and sodium cocoa butterate is from cocoa butter. So it's, of, it's often quite easy to work out where your soap products have come from, from the names. But what can we do? So there are a few alternatives. What I want you guys to think about nice and quickly is what else can we do to try and reduce our use of plastic and our use of these ingredients? So each of these came in plastic bottles and some of them had some nasty ingredients for the environment or things that aren't very sustainable. What could we do instead? Pop any ideas in the chat. We'll have about 30 seconds to get some ideas in there. I'm sure you guys were already thinking. I'll start getting some ideas in nice and quickly because I'm sure you've got some brilliant ideas of how we can reduce the use of small bottles for soap. So somebody said check the ingredients. Yep, brilliant, because we need to check what's in what we're using to know whether it's got to know whether it's got any bad ingredients in. So some of the things that we looked at could be considered bad ingredients if they are potentially harmful to the environment. 
Okay, so we've had someone says reduce, reuse, recycle, and make good choices. Always fantastic advice. Um, so someone else has said use soap bars rather than liquids and shampoo bars. Now, one of the problems with shampoo bars is it's really hard to find them without sodium lauryl sulfate in. The best shampoo bars have sodium lauryl sulfate in. A lot of the ones that don't have them in don't act the same way on your hair. So people struggle to use those as they don't act like traditional shampoo. So there are some things to watch out for. Yes, a shampoo bar will take up less space in transport so it'll have a lower environmental impact. But again, you still have to check your ingredients. Any more ideas before we move on of what you could do? All right. There's one other answer come through there. Yep. So byproducts with less packaging waste and, and a great idea, use refills. So I think our first example is buying large. So you saw before that our um, shampoo bottles, there's a small bottle, it fit in my hand. This one, however, is a big bottle. And I, I took this picture in one of my local shops where you can buy the large bottles. So these are five litre bottles. So they're really big bottles. And you can refill your smaller bottles at home with these. And you can do that with hand soap, shampoo, conditioner, shower gel, or even cleaning products. Still creating plastic waste, but there's less packaging for one big bottle than there are for 10 small bottles. If you can get to a refill shop, they refill these bottles. So they keep one of these bottles with a big pump on the top and they refill them. So you can take your small bottle and fill up with the same products that you would use every day anyway, your hand soap, your body wash, cleaning products, shampoo and conditioner. And this is a fantastic option to reduce your plastic waste. So this is the same shop that I buy my washing up liquid from. So I refill the same bottle every time I go into my washing up liquid. Another option is bar soaps. So some of these are made without palm oil or tallow, and you can find these often in health food shops, but they are becoming more widely available. So I found some recently, some really good ones actually on sale in Tesco, and they had um, ones without tallow and without palm oil. So remember, this is a point we made before, we need to check the ingredients because some are better than others. And some have packaging that's better, easier for us to recycle. And um, some soaps come unpackaged if they're bar soaps. Or what we can do is we can make our own soap. Benefits of this, you can choose your ingredients. It is a bit difficult because we have to use some chemicals. So it uses lye and that must be handled by a responsible adult. So you can work this out yourself. I make my own soap at home and I use an online calculator to find out how much of each ingredient I need. That means I don't have to do the maths. Someone else does it for me. It's all done. And all I have to do is weigh out my ingredients. If you wanted to do this, if you wanted to skip the, the scary step of using the lye, you can also get some eco melt and pour soaps. And what you do with those is you melt them and you pour them into a mold nice and easy. So how many of those options can you guys remember? So there were a few alternatives to the products that we were looking at before. And they are ways to reduce our single use plastic. Which ones can you remember out of the four examples that we've just gone through? What might be a good option for you? So we've got answers coming through on the chat. Someone said buy big, perfect. That was our first answer, buying big bottles. Who can remember the next option? What was the next option? So we could buy five litre bottles and refill our smaller bottles at home, but that remember still creates plastic waste. What's the next option? 
What else could we do? Fantastic. So the next thing we could do is refill at a refill shop. But what if you don't have a refill shop near you? What if you don't want to be buying this plastic? What could you do? We could use bar soap. Now, most people have probably used bar soap before. In fact, a lot of the ingredients in these bar soaps can actually be a bit kinder on your skin if you remember to read the ingredients. And you can, if you want to, make your own homemade soap. So what we're going to look at is how do you make your own soap? So really important that the lye is caustic. And what that means is if you get it on your skin, it can burn. This is why an adult wearing gloves and goggles must mix the lye. So when you mix the lye with water, this gives out heat. And this has another keyword, it's an exothermic dissolution. And that means that it gives out heat. So you have to use a thermometer when you mix the lye because it can get very, very hot and it needs to be mixed carefully. And you must add the lye to the water in small amounts and not the other way around. Can anybody tell me why you think you add the lye to the water and not the other way around? If it lets out lots of heat, why do you think we add it to the water and not adding the water to the lye? Someone said easier to control. Yeah, that is, that is right. What do you think would happen if we put all the water into the lye straight away, if it lets out heat when it dissolves? Yeah, so it would get too hot. And you really don't want it to get too hot because if you're mixing this in your kitchen, you don't want anything to get too hot that it might hurt you. So we're going to watch a quick video. Yep, that's also a good point. It reduces the hazard and the dispersion of the fumes. So if you add it all too quickly, then that makes the... Um, it dissolves very quickly and you need to keep a window open, keep it nice and ventilated. So if you do it slowly, it reduces the risks. So what I want you to do while watching this video is watch out for any key points. We're going to go over the key points at the end. So if you've got pen and paper, feel free to make notes or you can just try and remember the key points. So remember, this needs an adult to do the dangerous steps. This is some soap that I made. This must be done safely and responsibly with gloves and goggles at all times. So the equipment should only be used for soap, nothing that will then be used for food. Here I've used olive oil and coconut oil, which are really easy to get from the shops. The lime must be handled by a responsible adult because it can burn your skin. If the lye gets on your skin, wash it off with cool water. If you spill it on a side, you can neutralize it with vinegar and wipe that up. So here is the warning symbol on my bottle of lye. And if you get it on your skin, rinse with cold water, so cool water. So this needs to be handled and mixed in a well-ventilated area by a responsible adult. You must measure out the right amount of your lye. That's very, very important.
Now again, add lye bit by bit to the water and not the other way around. And we try to keep the temperature under about 60 degrees. So here you see me adding the lye to the water and that went slightly above 60 degrees. So try and keep it under that if you do this. And here I'm measuring out my coconut oil. Coconut oil will make the soap slightly harder than some other oils will. And it gives it slightly better bubbles as well. So I've melted that oil and mixed it with my olive oil. So remember, we can't use anything that's also used on food. So I have a spare blender that I use for soap. So we blend this until it reaches the consistency of mayonnaise or custard. And this is called trace. And we want to get it to this point because this is when we've got the reaction starting. So you see it's nice and thick and leaves a mark. This is when I add the essential oils. So I made this smell like oranges. And you can see that it's quite an orange essential oil. And I mix this into my soap. And I've got some silicone um, soap molds. You can use old tubs just lined with greaseproof paper. Very gently shake these molds to get any air bubbles out. You would do the same with melt and pour soaps as well. So you leave these to dry out for 24 hours. What I do is I pop these in the freezer for 30 minutes to make them a bit firmer, which pops them out of the mold a little bit easier. You can see how easily they come out of the mold there. And then after I've made this soap, it needs four to six weeks to finish reacting and to harden. And here's a picture of me using my homemade soap. So how many key points can you remember? In the chat, write as many key points as you can. Don't worry if you can't remember them all, we're going to go through them again quickly. Fantastic, gloves and goggles. Really, really key point when you're working with any dangerous chemicals. Always, always wear gloves and goggles. Any other key points that people can remember? Yeah, we need to use a thermometer. Why do we need to use the thermometer? Because we need to know the temperature. Perfect. Any other key points that I made in that video that you guys can remember? Fabulous. Yeah, don't use equipment that you use with food. That's because we're using chemicals and we don't want to get it all mixed up. So we need to accurately measure our ingredients. Fantastic, got some great answers through here. Open your windows, yep. So we'll go through these. So the bowl, mixer, jug and thermometer should not be used on food. That's because we're using chemicals and we don't want to get our food mixed up with any of those chemicals. So mixing the lye is exothermic. That means it will get very hot. So you need to do that carefully and slowly. Make sure that a responsible adult is doing that step. So yep, the line must be mixed by an adult wearing gloves and goggles. Somebody made that point in the chat. The lye must be added to the water, not the other way around. We remember that that's for safety because it gets very hot if you add the, the lye all at once. The lye mixture should be mixed with the oils once cooled. So if the lye mixture is still very hot and you mix it with the oils, it will be, um, it won't react as well. We need them at a very similar temperature when you're reacting those. Otherwise the heat could be quite bad, especially if you accidentally flick some of that mixture on your skin. So make sure that you mix the lye and the oils when they are cooler. Okay. Some people have to go. So thank you very much to those people for listening. And uh, I hope you learned something about making soap.
So remember we add the scent after the mixture reaches trace and it should be left for four to six weeks. So quick activity then. What products can we swap out? What might be better? What can we swap out? And what swaps can you make? So quick activity to see what we can swap out, what impacts um, we can have, uh, how we can improve our impacts by using different products. Yep. So refills instead of single use plastic bottles, switching to eco soaps. I think I think with that one, that's really good. You need to check the ingredients. Ah, we've had an interesting answer here. Limit use of antibacterial soap. So the soap itself. Remember how we were talking at the start is going to be naturally washing away the germs on your hands anyway. What we probably need to be limiting the use of is anything that claims to be um, killing most of the bacteria. We are obviously, when we wash our hands, we are doing that. But a lot of the added ingredients in these soaps are actually quite harmful. So, we are still washing away the germs when we wash our hands, but some of the other soaps that say they are antibacterial do have extra ingredients in that maybe aren't that good. So that's, that's a bit of a strange one because we are actually washing away the germs whenever we use soap, regardless of whether it says it's antibacterial or not. So making our own soap, yes, that will limit our environmental impact because we won't have to travel. Um, so that soap itself will not have to be packaged. It won't have traveled. It will um, not come in any packaging. Plus it's fun to do. Okay, so we've got some really good swaps there. So we'll go through those answers. So, we could swap our liquid shampoo, shower gel and hand soap for refills. The refills, um, they at home at first, so we could get larger bottles or we can swap those for refills at a local shop if you've got access to a local refill shop. We could swap those for eco bar soap or homemade soap. And then traditional bar soap that you might use can be swapped out for eco bar soap or your own homemade soap. So there's lots of different things you can use. There's options of swaps that you can make depending on what works for you. So with simple ingredients, you can also make other alternatives like bath bombs, bath melts, salves, moisturizers, and more. So are there any questions? And to reflect on this, I want you guys to think about what swaps might you be able to make? What might work for you? If you don't have a refill shop near you, what might you be able to do? And I know I mentioned earlier that I also do... Brilliant, yep, I'll answer that question in a moment. I also mentioned that I use things, um, refills for my cleaning products. So for my washing up liquid, I will get a refill from my local refill shop. For some people that might not work, but there are a lot of options here for you guys to make swaps and to have a think about what might be in the products that you're using. So someone's asked that I mentioned eco, melt and pour soaps. So melt and pour soaps, you buy a block of soap that you melt and then you pour it into your own shape. The eco melt and pour soaps will have um, 
better surfactancies. So remember, we looked at our ingredients. The eco ones will have plant based surfactants and um, they will have sulfate free. So remember our sodium laurel sulfate. A lot of the times, the eco ones will be sulfate free. So you can find these quite easily in shops and online. Um, if you wanted to make your own soap, but we're a bit scared to use the lye, you can still get good options to make your own soap without having to do the scary chemical bit. Any more questions? Anyone wanting to write a reflection on what they might swap out in the future or things they might consider when buying their cleaning products and their shower gels? So where do I get my ingredients? So actually for the soap that I made in this video, I bought my oils from Lidl because Lidl is my local shop. You can get coconut oil and olive oil in most supermarkets. Um, my lye, I actually bought online. So I bought that from um, eBay, actually. Uh, there's a few soap companies that sell their products either on their websites or on eBay. And any um, other oils that I do use for these, I do buy from um, soap companies that have um, good quality ingredients. Any more questions? Any more reflections? So this is an interesting question. If we don't recycle or reuse our soap bottle, do you know how long it will last in the landfill before it degrades? So that's, this actually depends. So your soap bottle will be different to your shampoo bottle. And if you feel it, the plastic might feel a bit different. So the bottles are often made of different plastics. Now, does anybody know how long plastic takes to break down? Any guesses? Okay, no guests come through. Yeah, okay, thousands of years. Yeah, um, obviously I can't say exactly how long it would be because it would depend on a few things such as the plastic and the conditions in the landfill. But plastic would take a very, very, very long time to break down. So whilst we're, all, whilst we're thinking about the impact of the soap that we use, we must also think about the impact of what we're buying it in. So to reduce the plastic bottles that we are putting into a uh, landfill, or even if we're recycling them, it still uses energy to recycle that bottle. So to try and reduce our impact, considering the packaging as well as what's inside it is always important. But that was a great question. So yes, if, if your plastic bottle ended up in landfill, it would take thousands of years to degrade. So fantastic ideas, good questions here. Any more questions? I think you've answered those questions really well. Thank you, Bryony. Thank you for a really good Thank session you. here. Great presentation. Um, and if anyone wants to look at any other resources that we've got, you can visit the Science for Society website at www.sys.org. And uh, we've got more presentations on the rest of this week. So hopefully we'll see you in one of our other presentations. Thanks very much, Bryony. Thank you.